Okay, can you all see the screen now? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Lovely, lovely. Thank you. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to look at a development that has happened in the last, literally the last two weeks. Um, and I'm looking at the future of generative AI, and I'm trying to develop a new set of scenes as a framework for evaluating what it is we want to achieve. It's sort of based around the idea of the Vs for big data that we've had now for the last, what, 22 odd years, um, which started with three Vs which defined big data and then became a framework of five, seven, 12 and more Vs which posed questions. And I wanted to do the same thing here for um, generative AI, because generative AI is something that came to the world's real attention on the 30th of November 2022, when uh, ChatGPT suddenly burst on the market. So the context that I've got is I'm teaching a module at the master's level called Analytics, Ethics, Trust and Governance for the big MSc Big Data Analytics, which we run here in the University of Derby. And when we created this program about six, eight years ago, this master's program was the only program in the world which actually had a dedicated module covering ethics, trust and governance. And what we are looking at this term, because I'm teaching this in the spring semester every year, what we're looking at is a, a broad question that I set to the students last year. It was Quest, uh, gener uh, it was um, big data, I think it was, questions of ethics, trust and governance. And this year, I'm looking at the broad topic area of generative AI applications, questions of ethics, trust and governance. And this gives them a very, very large area that they then need to narrow in to a very specific context, uh, use case uh, that is interesting to them and that they hopefully know a little bit about so they can then think about how to uh apply various frameworks in the past we've been using because of the trust governance ethics side we've been using things like the european union's general data protection regulations the um and more recently the european union's ai act and going back a little bit in relation to that with the concept of model cards and data sheets from Tim, timnit gebru and Margaret Mitchell X of uh, Google um, a few years ago. And it's kind of developed my thoughts over the last six weeks I've been teaching the module for this semester, that those frameworks, GDPR, AI Act and so on, don't really provide either the students with a set of interesting questions, but nor does it help people in business because we know that businesses are trying desperately to find applications of uh, large language models of the um, text to image the text to video and so on and reflecting back on the v's of big data it struck me we could come up with some c's of um, generative ai now, it also happens that most of the C's and most of the V's actually apply to pretty much any application of IT. We've just got to think a little bit carefully at, at times. So the context, let's think about all of the different sort of language models, the videos, the creators, and so on and so forth that we've, we, we've come to, I won't say know and love, but certainly know them. And yet, we're seeing problems. They're off in the land of the fairies half the time. They're dreaming. They're wrong. And they cost a fortune to train. Estimates are that at the moment it's using as much electricity, or generative AI is using as much electricity as I think it was San Francisco at the moment or Los Angeles, and is estimated to increase by a factor of around about 10. Uh, by 2030, using water like it was going out of fashion. 
So there's some really interesting problem areas that we perhaps ought to be thinking about. We need a framework that helps us to focus on some of the really important things. Let's just go back as a starter to how language models work. You start off in the middle with a sort of traditional NLP, natural language processing concept of tokenization, because you can't compute with words. Computers can only compute with numbers. And so you turn words into one or more tokens. And then you've someone developed the transformer technology for creating the output based on some prompts that it then does stuff and comes up with some output, which is just kind of autocomplete on steroids. It, it completes the input prompt. It's not answering the question, even though we anthropomorphize it. It's actually just completing the prompt in a very, very convincing way that looks as though it might be an answer. And we use all sorts of things to solve the problems that the transformer creates. And of late, we've had people say, oh, use knowledge graphs or long phrase tokenization, use retrieval augmented generation rag, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem is you can't actually stop the transformer making mistakes because it is a stochastic parrot. It's a probability based token creator. That is all it is based around some sort of language model, which has some sort of probabilistic relationships, weights between words and words or tokens and tokens to be precise. And even, and I do this with my own CV because I know my CV and we can all do this test. If we know our CVs, we can get the system or these LLMs to actually create our CVs or summary CVs, see what comes out. Because we will recognize the errors. I can't look at um, Professor Kalaus's uh, CV and know whether through this system or these systems and know whether or not it's fantasizing. But it got it wrong. This research retrieval augmented generative uh, process is supposed to fix all the errors. It doesn't. You can't even make sure that it's talking about the right person. This was Bing chat. And the, sec the third um, link there that it was using for Rich itself is somebody else, not me. But it doesn't know about that. It can't reason. That's a problem. We saw with Sora, and there's a video on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. Just check for Richard Self, University of Derby, and you'll see the latest YouTube I posted there is a, an analysis of Sora, the OpenAI's um, video creator. And I, I've analyzed based purely on what OpenAI say about Sora, about how it works. And although I've not been able to capture it in this part of the video, her legs pass through each other. No real world fidelity, no physics engine. And I've just taken the whole thing apart. And it's a trivial system. It's clever, but it's trivial. It takes your input prompt into GPT-4, which produces all of the text prompts that drive um, an extended version of DALI-3. Using a clever use of an existing technology which has no fidelity to the real world. We know that there are other system problems. These were the responses of Gemini, the Google machine, to produce me pictures of Vikings. And we know historically there were no black Vikings, period. Just didn't happen. No real world uh, fidelity, wokeness here on this one. And we know about the stories of, please produce me a picture of a black doctor treating white children. It will, the, all of the video uh, image generation systems will fail to do that, where they will always give you a picture of a white man treating black children. What's interesting, and I did this very, very briefly, was to, based on some thoughts from one of my students, was what happens if you change a single word 
in your input question or input prompt. And the first and the third, I've just changed process to mechanism because in common parlance, they're pretty much the same in terms of those questions. Okay, so process is recipe, mechanism is kind of mechanics, tools, but it was interesting to see what happened. It, and the, the reason for this was thinking about education, particularly of younger children. But the challenge for you is at the bottom. Just find three questions that are all ident pretty much identical in the way that humans think and see what the machines come up with. So in there are very many areas where we're worried about trust. How much are we interested in accuracy, consistency, completeness? Um, and these three guys, Nate, guys here are three of my current master students, and they've helped come up with some rather interesting words and thoughts around this whole thing. We need to think a little bit about as we go into all the sort of general uses of these tools, are they specialist or general purpose? And we'll come to that in the, towards the end. And then we need to be thinking about where do we go in the future? Is Sam Altman correct about his ideas of scaling to artificial general intelligence? Who knows? Some of the questions that are coming up in a few minutes are very much going to help us to think about, is AGI feasible based on current pure LLM technology? Or do we need something completely new? Because what we want to ask ourselves is, as a business, as an organization, as academics, as and so on, is generative AI suitable for my situation? But you know, how do I know what are the questions I really, really ought to be asking myself? Do we have a problem? I don't think. Oh, can you write the words? Oh, uh, Risa. Uh, Dr. Blair, you have your audio open, so your microphone. So we need to be thinking about, as we are in business, yeah. about ethics, we need to be thinking about trust. We, you know, we think we know that we have a load of uh, questions about is ethical AI feasible? Uh, can AI be taught ethics? And so on. We need to be thinking of as we go into using yeah. our AI tools, as we have yeah. done with all forms oh, of um, IT technology over the many years. Happen to them. Nobody's going to touch them. Uh, Dr. Blair, you have your microphone open. Yes. Um, and so we, we, we've we known for many, many decades, certainly to my knowledge, I've been involved in IT in one form or another for about five, five decades now. Um, you now, we need to think about the governance strategy to look after ourselves, to ensure that as an organization, we don't get ourselves into trouble. And so we need to know the sorts of laws, the sorts of regulations that we are subject to. So as we think a little bit about as a start, we think about a critical assessment of our use of generative AI. So we start off here with the first two C's of, um, of generative AI. The challenges and the consequences. Are we going to be pushing this enormous boulder up a hill. And it seems looking at the sort of commentaries that are coming thick and fast, is it trying to get large language models and other forms of generative AI to be useful? It's really very, very difficult. Because the consequences are kind of interesting. Is it going to come and hit me from behind? Can I evaluate, I even identify the rapidly dispersing range of consequences, the difficulties, the challenge it's going to pr uh, produce for my organization? I saw her. 
Um, Mr. Masakini, uh, your microphone's open. And so we got these challenges, we have these consequences. But I want to break those down into more, more meaningful uh, aspects. We need to be thinking as we begin to look at technology, and this is something we've learned time after time the last 20, 30, 40 years. Do we understand the systems? Do we understand the technology? Do we understand how transformers work for language models? Do we understand the way that diffusion models work for images and videos? Because in one sense, they are part of the classic intellectual laziness we've seen now for 20, 25 years around big data analytics. The don't worry about how it works, just throw vast amounts of data at statistics and find the patterns. And that's what they've done with language models. They, that's what they've done with diffusion models. Throw data, find the patterns. Don't worry about in language models, semantics and semiology and, 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 and. Just worry about the patterns. The next challenge is what can it do? Fundamentally, LLMs are pure stochastic parrots. They have no technical understanding. They just, those huge vectors, those word vectors, 4,096 um, weights in a vector, a word vector for GPT-4 is, is alleged. Do they really incorporate knowledge? Do they incorporate reasoning? Can the machine understand? Can it plan? We heard only a few weeks ago that some military strategists are thinking, hey, we can use GPT-4 to produce military strategies. Are they completely out of their heads? Of course it can't. It doesn't do that sort of stuff. It's probabilistic. And so we then need to think about consequences. And these are some about what will happen and also what might happen. Some of the wills we know for certain already. Some we can kind of guess at. So we need to be thinking about the impact of harms. And we know about intellectual property infringements, image, copyrights, trademarks, and so on and so forth. We know there are multiple legal cases now against um, OpenAI and Microsoft for ChatGPT, having scraped the word, the internet for everything they can get hold of, irrespective of who owns the uh, copyright. So in terms of challenges, we're looking at things, C words like capability, creativity, clarity. I'll expand capability in a, in, in a slide or two, but creativity, <clears throat> The question is, can it be creative for image generation for video and so on? Can it be creative for literature? Who knows? It kind of seems like sometimes if you change what's called the temperature setting so that it doesn't choose the most probable next token, it chooses randomly from the next most ser or series of the next most uh, ones which kind of looks a little bit like creativity, but it's within the model's relationships. And it tends to be blander. And clarity, can we see clearly what it's doing, how it's doing? Do we understand really why it's making its decisions? But if we look at capability, you can see really four chunks. Do we understand the components and the connections? Think of Sora, the open AI uh, video creator. Yeah, it's simple, as they declare it. It is basically just ChatGPT4 feeding DALI 3, because feeding DALI 3 and making it do what you want is actually fairly hard work. So they've kind of used GPT4 to take your prompt and then do the prompt engineering to feed into DALI 3. So you've got your connections. But then if you think about connections, you've also got, 
I want to use it in a different context, an LLM, for example, as part of my workflow management, my processes. Do you understand how to connect and what will happen when you connect your workflow through the API to GPT-4, for example, and then get it to do stuff? And then you begin to get locked in. What happens when that, as we saw a few weeks ago, GPT-4 went bonkers for several hours? Can you afford that sort of connectivity that wrecks the output towards your customers, towards your um, stakeholders? How much control do we have? Well, it looks with Sora very little. It does its thing. And if you compare what it does and the way it does it with the sort of control that CG, uh, the sort of computer graphics people uh, do for games and videos and films where they can orchestrate huge armies. You can't do that with, uh, with the image generators. You can't control the language models, as I showed you with bonkers responses about my CV. Now, the interesting thing is we look at the top right-hand set of three. Correctness, consistency, completeness. This came out of the field of education. And thinking about the fact that we, as ed most of us as educators, we know that whatever we say, correctness, accuracy, is essentially non-negotiable. But then, and we've had quite a lot of skeptics standing, throwing rocks at LLM. So, yeah, they're not very correct all the time. They're not very consistent. You pose the same question 10 times, you get 10 different answers. And each of those answers is only partially correct. Well, step back. What do we, as educators, do? Yes, correctness is non-negotiable. It has to be correct, as correct as we can be. But consistency and completeness, not necessarily. We tailor our message, our answer to children, depending on our knowledge of them, their circumstances their progress, what we know, what we feel they're capable of understanding. So we may not give the same answer to different people, students. I mean, I was clearing some um, stuff, questions from students this morning on email. And each answer, even if it was meant to be in a sense the same, it was different. And the other thing is we don't always give a complete answer. We don't have time. And then move down to the bottom right hand, connotation. And this, for many of the uh, members of the IIS and so on, is actually quite important. Meaning. What do the symbols mean? What do the words mean? The symbology. Semiotic. How do we think that a system like an LLM will begin to be able to understand all of those interesting different meanings that different words have? The way that they hold kind of an image. So connotation puts us deep, deep, deep into transdisciplinary type of environment but we need to think very carefully and if we're using image generators in marketing in retail and llms you have to think very carefully about that semiotic semi semiology because so much of that written um marketing information the brochure and the images in the brochure are very, very heavily based on very interesting aspects, connotation. Do you understand it as a business, what you are put, getting yourself into? And then the consequences. Cost I've talked about, competition is kind of interesting. Have we got one runner up at the front? Have we got 
a field around us. How much lock-in might we end up with if something goes wrong? If, for example, OpenAI have to close down the whole GPT family because of copyright issues, what will happen to your business? Have you thought about compliance? The, we, we've seen the issues of uh, lawyers who've got briefs from GPT uh, 3.5 and so on, and it's fantasized completely about all the cases it's quoting. The judge got a little bit tetchy, to be honest. Fined the uh, solicitor about $5,000. And he became the laughing stock of the world. Not very good. But you need to be thinking about yourself as an organization. Are you compliant with relevant laws and regulations? And do you know properly? the context that you're going to be using, and how you define context, how you discover context, whether you use the six Ws, who, how, why, what, where, when. You know, there's lots of different ways, but you need to think about the context that, we're, that will generate some of your uh, consequences. But also, this is the one, one of the words which comes back across to capabilities. What's the context that you want to use your tool in? So here we have a summary in a hierarchical sort of form of the 16 C's of generative AI. And in the week, the last week, well, last week it was this week's Easter holidays, but the previous week, um, my students were already beginning to find this framework so much more useful for them than uh, they were finding the GDPR and the AI Act and other things. So it turns out that this is actually quite helpful to students and they keep telling me this, so which is kind of nice. One last point before we close. Is AI, the regenerative AI, a tool for everyone that can answer everybody's questions? We know that's not true, but that's what OpenAI and others, Anthropic with Claude and so on are saying. But then you have, on the other hand, OpenAI say, oh, uh, no, to get a good answer, you need to do prompt engineering. And the second reference here by Alfred is actually referring to their prompt, the OpenAI prompt engineering guide, which kind of suggests that to use an LLM effectively and many of these other tools, you need a lot of training, a lot of practice, and it's a skill on a par with any other business skill. So the question that we need to pose back at the world, at the world of the providers of these tools is which do you guys mean an LLM and other generative AI actually is? So my question, Fundamentally, to all people thinking about using LLA, uh, generative AI in all its forms, is we need a framework that will help you to work out whether it will work for you in your circumstances and can you afford the costs and the consequences. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Here in this, my thoughts. And I'll stop recording. Shall I stop recording here, uh, Najib? Oh, yes, please. Uh, you can continue recording. I think I'll, I'll carry yeah, on please. recording then. Because uh, Dr. Blair has got a good question. Oh, let me have a Hi. look at the chat. Hi, Dr. Self. This was really fascinating. 
You know, I just look at the periphery and I just use the tools as a means to an end. And I don't often think about all the infrastructure that goes into it, which is so amazing and could just consume you completely. If you really did all that thinking all the time about how AI is fed with all the models, with the imperfections, I kind of look at the other side and I'm thinking about, you know, is using AI effectively, is this an elite skill for people where you really do need to have the training with prompt engineering? And what's more so, you need to have phenomenal critical thinking skills to make the assessment as to whether or not your net result is <clears throat> functional, applicable, realistic, because we, we already know, we already know there are mistakes, but you know, as an academic, I feel like this really can be a useful tool for us to at least start to develop frameworks and drafts, and even for our students too. But the caution is that you can't do this without that applied critical thinking and analysis of what the net result is. I think you're right there. Um, I think you're right to concentrate on critical thinking. I mean, to be sometimes when people ask me what I teach, I give them a flip answer, which is I teach critical critical thinking, nothing else. I just happen to use different sort of modules, different topic areas. I mean, the only area I probably wouldn't want to touch on would be so sort of pharmacology and tax, where the numbers are, are more more important than anything else. <laughs> but but pretty much everything else that I've ever taught since I was become an academic has been. You might say applied critical thinking. Um, so is AI more like us than we'd like to admit? Gee, depends which bit of AI. I think that this modern generative stuff is a serious problem because it's based on this intellectually lazy approach of throw the data at and see what patterns happen. They threw away the sort of ideas of um, semantics um, semantic networks, they threw away the idea of symbolic logic because it's all too difficult. We we threw away in the 80s, 90s, knowledge-based systems because they're non-scalable, they're too difficult to engineer. And so in the sort of 2010s, I guess, people started thinking, well, we've got traditional sort of what we called AI since 2002 or thereabouts, big data analytics. Um, which again is the intellectually lazy approach to throw data, large amounts of data at um, suitable statistics and uh, see what happens. And so I, I don't think what we've got at the moment is anything like humans. And I think that you're right with your second question is that, yes, we do need. I mean, if you think about the image generation, DALI 3 um, uh, and the other diffusion based models, it takes us back to Second Life. I don't know if you ever tried using Second Life. I gave up after after I couldn't even get out of the um, the entrance lobby. It wasn't going to be worth it to me. Um, so it raises interesting questions. If it takes that much effort, it's not a general purpose tool. And